Welcome back to Golden Rule Radio this week, your weekly precious metals recap and outlook for the coming week. And without any hesitation, let's jump right into the gold markets here today, Miles. Yeah, Tori, I think it's important uh, pointing out what gold is doing compared to some of the other metals and oil, which we'll get to here in a few minutes. Uh, But especially with the Dow news, which I know everybody wants us to talk about, we'll dive right into gold and say gold is still sitting below uh, that old low point, uh, the 2017 low at about 1235. We've bounced off that a couple times. You know, we did mention a few weeks ago how that's our first real resistance level. So it's reacting exactly the way we think it should. Uh, I think if the Dow continues down, unless we have something psychotic happen uh, in the futures and options market, which was our topic last week, uh, then we could see gold continue to push up. Yeah, we did bounce briefly for a second in the 1239. You know, we were all asleep during the London market, uh, but it was unable to hold, as you point out. You know, we really need to see it close, right? Yeah, I always prefer closes personally uh, because it shows that the market's willing to go to bed that night uh, with a higher or lower price, depending on which way the trend is. Well, up until the last couple of days, the dollar really hadn't moved much. In fact, at this time last week, we'd actually seen the dollar drop a little bit. Now we're back up into the 96 and in, in some change range and you're going to put that chart up here uh we don't have robert the the dollar guru today but uh without him we'll we'll sort of struggle through the dollar conversation but what's important is that gold is sort of setting its own pace in some regards just like the dollar is so the the equities markets we're seeing big downturns which we'll get to in a bit uh dollar up and gold up. So gold is doing just what it should in times of uncertainty and instability and and certainly volatility. Sure. So if we do push past 1235, which I actually think is likely at this point, uh, our next stopping or at least pausing point at uh, mid 1200s, 1255, 1260. And then of course that big 618 fib takes us back to a number we talked a lot about throughout the course of the years, 1280, 1285. Uh, so we're we're seeing the stair steps up. Uh, it certainly doesn't hurt that the dollar is really going nowhere, uh, which is expected with the change over the last year to an interest rate policy and interest rates starting to rise. Uh, of course, we'll get to Trump uh, discussing how interest rates are the only possible reason uh, that uh, we're seeing There's drops in the Dow, <laughs> which technically, I guess the guy's right. I mean, the entire rise in the Dow over the last four or five years has been solely due to uh, easy money. Right. Uh, so money becoming less easy obviously makes it harder and harder for people to borrow to invest. Of course, he would love to see the interest rate policy that the Fed had while Obama was president, right? It gives you certainly far more options and many more open doors. But now he is speaking out against the Fed. In fact, We talked about that last week, and now it's on the cover of the Wall Street Journal this morning, where he's getting a little bit louder with his uh, sentiments towards Fed Chair Powell, and he did appoint him, and he's wondering if he doesn't have regrets. Sure, and I have an appreciation for that. I mean, a president isn't supposed to be everybody's best friend. They're supposed to be a parent. They're supposed to be kind of guiding the country as best as possible. Uh, Frankly, a president shouldn't have anything to do with interest rate policy, but that gets back to what the job of a president really was supposed to be 200 years ago. Um, But I like the idea that somebody's got to be the bad guy here. You know, somebody has to realize what the long-term damage to just rampant and runaway inflation can be. And... Uh, zero ZERP or even negative NERP interest rate policy for extended periods of time, uh, what kind of negative effect that can have on an economy, regardless of what you think the uh, equities market is doing, uh, the cost of living versus income and and everything else is just, it's can be devastating. Well, they've been raising interest rates strictly off of the discussion of inflation. It really hasn't been about the economy at all. And in the coming weeks, we're actually going to do a little side program here to Golden Rule Radio, and we're going to have a couple guests on that speak directly to this interest rate discussion. So we'll move on from here for now, but we'll keep you posted on when that's published. And that's going to be not only very timely, but very educational on just how interest rates are manipulated and how they are not controlled. And then obviously their impact on on the overall economic picture. But jumping back to gold miles, I'll, I'll tell you, you know, you calling for higher prices. The main reason I'm so bullish right now too just in this little micro cycle is that the commitments of traders report that came out last week 
showed a huge change. Now, we've touched on this in, in previous shows about how we had a record short position in the futures market in gold. Now, each gold contract is 100 ounces, and we had a net position of over 80,000 short contracts, meaning there's a lot of people betting that gold's going to go down. Well, we saw a huge flip last week. In fact, 46,957 fewer short contracts in gold. That is a huge turnaround, and that's a lot of money leaving their short position, betting that gold is actually going to go long and go up. Sure. If I'm not mistaken, that's more than half. So in a single week, we had a substantial flip in the caught report. I'm anxiously awaiting this week's. You know, we're just a, a couple days away, and so we'll we'll try to give you updates as we see that play out, but you should see it coincide with rising gold prices. Sure. And the reason that we tangent off on the other things when we talk about gold is there are times when gold does become the mercury in the thermometer. It isn't always, but there are times that happens. So, and the other thing that we want everybody to pay attention to, not just what the dollar and the equities market are doing, because that can have a panic, but the reason we bring up futures and options market is because we don't want to forget what happened back in the 2009, 2010 markets. You know, people forget gold took a 400 point drop before it took, what, a 1,400 point, 1,300 point rise. Uh, So you can have that big sell-off in the paper assets, which is also a heavily leveraged vehicle, which can short-term affect the price of physical product. So don't get scared. In fact, get real excited if you wake up two months down the road and you just lost 300 bucks in your gold price. That's actually one of the best pulling back, drawing back the arrow you can possibly think of, because that means all of the leverage just got cleaned out of the market. And you've got a long, rosy bull market ahead of you. Sure. So we want to see gold go up, but we're not ashamed to see it go down aggressively short term because we know how markets respond. So let's move over to the white metals. You got anything on silver? Oh, silver's up just 1% last week. It's not showing the same strength that gold is, but it's not the true money metal that gold is. Uh, it will follow suit a little bit, but we've seen that ratio widen back out again. To me, the white metals are more of an economic indicator. You talk about the mercury and the thermometer. I do think that the white metals are that for the economy and, and inflation, and inflation really is remaining somewhat in check. The economy, uh, we'll talk a little bit about here in a little bit. Nobody's talking about the global downturn. Nobody's talking about much the U.S. domestic downturn, but the economic numbers, as we talked about a month ago, waiting for these quarterly reports and earnings reports to start coming in. Uh, we didn't think they were going to look great. They don't look great. And that transitions us right into the into the equities markets. Right. And silver is still well below that declining trend line and way below its 200-day moving average. So we could see some movement in silver. Uh, finally, platinum and palladium. Platinum kind of the same as silver. It's sort of inching up, so we don't need to touch on that too deeply here because uh, it's we're seeing the same patterns as silver. But palladium, which I think I'm just about done charting now. <laughs> for <laughs> I, think, I think I'm done with palladium. Palladium did put an inner day, brand new, all-time high. Uh, it bounced back down below that. I mean, it broke well above my micro trend three drives pattern i thought we'd see last week and i give up palladium's just going to do what palladium's going to do and and that this is panic buying for whatever reason it may well, not be may fear not panic, panic but yeah more yeah, like this speculation is, like yeah well speculation it can be a form of panic too <laughs> i mean you're afraid of losing out right right that's what speculation go. is yeah. So I, I don't know what's going on with palladium. I give up. Somebody smarter than me can figure that one out. But I do know this. When those ratios realign, I'm going to be real happy I own a bunch of platinum right now. That's right. Palladium is going to be driven by a conversion from diesel engines to more gas-driven engines. So from an industrial standpoint, there's that. It is cheaper, obviously, for catalytic converters in general. And, and with an economic downturn, it doesn't surprise me to see the industrial aspect being utilized a little bit more than platinum where they have the crossover in their function. Uh, But you're right from a predictability, when you start looking at industrial metals, very, very hard to predict because it plays into, again, that huge macroeconomic picture. Right. Okay, Tori, here we go. I know you're ready and I know the listeners at home want it. Uh, Let's talk equities. That's where the excitement is. Excitement, fear, panic, trepidation, whatever you want to call it. This is the old adage when greed turns to fear. What's going to happen now when there's fear in the markets? And there is fear in the markets. We're hearing it in the voices of our clients on the phone. And obviously, you're seeing it in the equities market. So, Miles, why don't you recap what the Dow and NASDAQ and S&P did today? 
Sure. Well, starting actually with the Dow Transportations, you know, Richard Russell for decades always said uh, through Dow Theory, Dow Transports lead the Dow Industrials. It doesn't matter what you're producing if you're not shipping and selling it. So that's why it's always good to start with the transports and move out from there uh, when you're seeing some major movement. So the transports actually moved below their 200-day moving average pretty substantially about a week ago. Uh, they came back up to it, were unable to breach back above and have obviously fallen off the cliff just like uh, the equities markets have. So the reason this matters is because the shipping companies have taken their beating first and they've moved into what can be arguably a micro bear uh, moving below that 200 day moving average. Now we've got to stay there. We'd obviously want to see it retest a few times. However, a week later, the Dow Industrials, as of now, are trading below their 200-day moving average, which has not happened, I believe, in a number of years at this point. So this is the first time, even with the big crash we had earlier this year, that 3,000 or so point sell-off back in January, February, uh, this is actually the first time we've pushed below that moving average. So not saying this is a definitive turn by any means. I think that there are some great arguments out there that we could see a massive crack-up boom uh, before the bust, uh, end-of-market speculation, we'll call it. So In I don't use markets, my word panic. Not just transports. No, not just transports, yeah. but all the markets. We could see some in the tax in just about everything. You know, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. Uh, so I think that's why we're starting to see the cracks now. We have a 3,000-point fall in, what, seven months to recoup it. Now we've had a 2,500-point fall in the Dow. In we'll see weeks, just a few weeks. Yeah, just know, a couple so. of weeks. So we'll see how long it takes for it to retest those old highs again. Um, but yeah, watching the Dow industrials follow the Dow transports, watching them push into something that resembles bearish territory. Almost there. I mean, you've got, uh, just in the S and P alone, there are four market sectors in the S and P 500 that are in correction territory down 10% and more. Uh, and that's actually before today's drop. So we are clo closing in on that 15% barrier there where you start seriously talking about a legitimate bear market. And the NASDAQ down 4.4% today. So finally, we see some weakness, some, some chink in the armor of the technology companies uh, that have been, you know, certainly propping everybody up. There's, there's been no breadth in the market. It's been a handful of stocks that have driven this train up, 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 up. And now you're starting to see as things uh, get a little pressure on the downward side, there's just not many stocks to ho help hold anything up. Everything follows suit as it, as it starts running downhill. Right. So as things start running downhill, the first thing people do is they run towards liquidity. So I think smart money is going to start doing that, even with interest rates going up and the expectation that continues. I think people are willing to lock in minimal losses at these interest rates on the, on the uh, yield curves in order to prevent potential massive losses in the equities market, especially big investor money. That coupled with the fact that the ECB is expected to raise interest rates later this year, uh, you should see uh, some benefit to the US dollar. And this may bring us all the way back to the big head and shoulders pattern Robert and I talked about a couple weeks ago that could be forming. So we could see 100 on the DXY uh, coming here down the next couple of months. It, uh, another couple points up in the Dixie, but eventually, yeah, those interest rate rises catch up with us. Yeah, I think you're already starting to see that flight of capital into cash positions. That That's part of this dollar rally, and it's part of what's going to get you, you know, potentially to the top of that shoulder. And to me, that's just like 2008. We talked on last week's show about how this is sort of shaping up like 2008 in a sense. And remember, the metals initially dropped on the big downturn. The dollar was king for a little bit. Everybody moved into cash. The dollar rallied, right? So that would coincide there with an equities market decline. Everybody flies into cash, into the U.S. dollar, and then you start to see things settle out uh, long before, you know, the, the equities ever have a chance to turn back. Your metals have taken off and run. Sure. And smart money doesn't want to sit in dollars too long. I mean, all dollar does is it provides you with liquidity to chase opportunity. So smart money's looking for that next opportunity. Well, before we leave the U.S. dollar, you know, another key piece of news is that foreigners are now shunning U.S. treasuries. This is all over the media, and we've known about this. We, you know, we talked again about Russia dumping all of its U.S. treasuries that it holds no U.S. debt now. Uh, but for now, China and Japan each still have more than a trillion dollars uh, each. 
but the Treasury buying by foreigners is almost half of what it was last year. So there's just not the interest in our debt, which is why you're seeing also our debt increase from a federal budget deficit standpoint. And you're also seeing interest rates climb. Again, we'll have a separate program for that. And to me, a big barometer on the economy too is oil. So watch oil's decline, uh, not to beat a dead horse, but you know, from the standpoint of it being down 8% on last week's show, now we're down 12.5%. You know, and, and a lot of that is just, again, fears of rising supply and, and slowing global growth. And if they're slowing global growth, why aren't people talking about it more? It's not about the U.S. equities markets. It's about slowing global growth and domestic growth. When you mentioned both slowing global demand uh, for U.S. currency as well as slowing global growth, uh, you know, that slowing global demand, I we mentioned the ECB and we mentioned uh, possibly some more uptrend in the dollar. But don't forget, we're talking about the dollar going from 96 to 100, not going from like 105 to 120. So we're still below the old highs. So don't think that we're bullish on the dollar by any means. We're just talking the, the midterm. In regards to oil and the slowing growth, we have the issues taking place in the Middle East, which has been one of our greatest oil allies through OPEC. And it would be a real devastation to the U.S. markets to lose our biggest, strongest ally over there, Saudi Arabia, with the Jamal Khashoggi incident. That would be tough. And, uh, you know... You talked about the dollar too. You're right. How can you be bullish on the dollar when our own federal deficit is almost $800 billion this year? So again, who wants to be buying U.S. treasuries? Who wants to fund this indefinitely? And I'll tell you, we get asked over and over again, when does it end? When does it end? What what stops it? And I'll tell you what, it's, what stops it. Interest rates stop it. They don't get to control interest rates. Interest rates control them. So ultimately, there's a day of reckoning when interest rates get so high that you can no longer service the debt, right? Your credit card interest rate gets so high, for example, that you can no longer make the minimum payment, much less work towards principal. That's the day of reckoning that the U.S. is going to see. And Tori, that's why we're going to have our special guests on in the next couple of weeks. So listeners at home, be on the lookout for that. We're going to be discussing the pending interest rate crisis as rates increase, what effect that has, not just on the equities market, but on our markets here in precious metals and how that affected the housing crisis. Uh, back about 10, 12 years ago. So, and, the, and the coming housing crisis. <laughs> and the potential coming housing crisis, which we're already starting to see. So that's going to do it for this week. Uh, thank you all for joining us, as always. If you liked what you heard, click the subscribe button, ring the bell to get notifications. Engage in the comments. Ask us some questions. We're happy to answer them on the air uh, when we do our show. Head on over to Twitter, at ICA Gold, or give us a call anytime at 1-800-525-9556. You can find us on Facebook at McIlvaney Financial or head on over to our website, McIlvaneyICA.com. Thanks. Have a great week. 